Good morning. And welcome on behalf of the League of Women Voters. My name is Peggy Creer. I'm president of the Milwaukee County League. The League of Women Voters has been engaging citizens in democracy for a long time, nearly a century now. The League was founded in 1920 as a nonpartisan grassroots organization. 1920 was the year the 19th Amendment was passed, guaranteeing women's voting rights. Our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. <laughs> Yay for democracy. Many people know the League for their work in, around voting and elections, but there's another side to what we do. We also study important issues, we advocate for policies that serve the public interest, and we educate voters through public issues forums like today's program. Our next public issues forum is November 17th, and that one is titled Addressing Lead Issues, a Focus on Milwaukee. I invite you to learn more about the League on our website, lwvmilwaukee.org, and I invite you to join us. Despite our name, we are open to everyone, women and men. We keep the name to honor our uh, founders. And now I'd like to turn it over to fellow League member Kathleen Dunn, who will introduce today's program. Thank you. Good morning. And if you haven't joined already, today would be a great day to join the League of Women Voters. I mean, a great day to do that. Abraham Lincoln said, I planted myself upon the truth, and the truth only so far as I knew it or could be brought to know it. I do not state a thing and say I know it when I do not. I mean to put a case no stronger than the truth will allow. With those sentiments in mind, and because we live in a time when the line between what is truth and what is fiction is becoming blurred, we gather today to hear a distinguished panel discuss truth, trust, and democracy in 2018. This year, the RAND Corporation, and it's worth, it's a very lengthy study, but it's worth your time to read it, did an exhaustive study of the reasons for and the consequences of what they call truth decay. And here's a brief summary of their findings. When basic facts and well-supported analyses of these facts were once generally accepted, disagreement about even objective facts has swelled in recent years, and a growing number of Americans view the US government, media, and academia with new skepticism. This drives wedges between policymakers and neighbors alike, and it poses a threat to the health and the future of US democracy. The Milwaukee County League of Women Voters will today address this serious threat. We have a distinguished and thoughtful panel examining the history of how we moved on to our better angels when they seemed lost. Historian John Meacham will start us off. Professor Young Mi Kim will speak on her investigation of the sponsors, sources, content, and targets of digital political campaigns across multiple platforms. Librarian Amy Waldman speaks to fake news and why disinformation is so prevalent now. Reporter Ashley, Ashley Lutheran will discuss research, facts, and fact-checking, and Professor Amy Shapiro challenges us to be critical thinkers. After each panelist has spoken, our moderator, Bonnie North, who I'll introduce momentarily, will start questions, and of course, we'd like for you to participate as well. We're passing out index cards, and you may want those as soon as you say you want one, we'll just pass them out to you. <laughs> They're gonna have an index card. Um, and one of the members of the committee putting together this forum will gather your questions. You can address them to one panelist or to all panelists or to several panelists. Just state what you would like and make it succinct. And um, let me have the members. Mary Sussman on the committee. There's Mary, raise your hand. You can pass your uh, questions to Mary. Peggy Creer. Terry Doerr, where's Terry? Terry Doerr. So send those in and then we will have a good long period for question and answer. I'm sure there will be many. Um, our moderator is Bonnie North, who recently returned from a three-week journalist exchange program in Germany and other European countries. Lake Effect has been airing her interviews with journalists and also with politicians. She's producer, co-host of Lake Effect, and she's been with WUWM since 2006. She spent a number of years also working as a director, technician, and stage manager in professional, educational, and community theater, and she started working in public broadcasting at Vermont Public Radio. We're happy to have her as our moderator today. Bonnie, it's yours. 
Thank you all very much, and it's a pleasure to see so many faces out there today. This is such an important topic, and you know we're, we're starting with the premise that a well-informed citizenry is essential to a healthy democracy, but as uh, Kathleen said, in the internet age, being well-informed is not easy. We are in an era of Russian disinformation campaigns, 24-hour opinion-based television that masquerades as news, and the use of social media to spread information that may or may not be true. And any society that values free speech must be up to the daunting task of sifting through a bombardment of information to find the truth, to find facts. So how do we become savvy, discerning, and well-informed? Well, again, it's hard. And so our important civic debates are all too often informed by opinion rather than facts. So today, we're hoping to mitigate that a little bit with our distinguished panel. And we're gonna start again with, uh, with John Meacham. And I'm gonna hopefully push that, the right button here. Yes, uh, this, is, uh, this is a recording that was done, actually while I was away, I would have interviewed him myself, but I was, as uh, Kathleen said, I was in Germany. And so Mitch Teich, the co-host of Lake Effect, did this interview, and the book that they, were, they had been talking about was this one, The Soul of America, The Battle for Our Better Angels. And Meacham is a Pulitzer Prize winning presidential historian, author of this book, as well as of Thomas Jefferson, The Art of Power, and Destiny and Power, The American Odyssey of George Herbert Walker Bush. He's also a distinguished visiting professor at Vanderbilt University and a contributing writer for the New York Times Book Review. He's also a fellow of the Society of American Historians. He joins us today in an interview recorded especially for this forum with Lake Effect's Mitch Teich. Happy to offer some thoughts to the League of Women Voters, a venerable organization, uh, as we head into the centennial of uh, the suffrage movement, the success of the suffrage movement. Speaking along the lines of history, uh, this book that you've written is a kind of a, a review of periods throughout history that have kind of mirrored the one that we're in now. What are the other key times in history where this battle for the soul of the country has played out that, that you think we really ought to remember as we live through this current battle for the nation's soul? I think there are three or four moments. One is the 1790s. It's been this way from the beginning. The first campaign to make America great again unfolded in 1800, eight years after the first president was sworn in. Thomas Jefferson talked about his uh, election as the revolution of 1800 because he believed that the country had already fallen away from its revolutionary principles. So everybody should take a deep breath. Uh, not take a deep breath and relax, but at least take a deep breath and look back and realize, try to discern what are the lessons about protest, what the lessons about bearing witness, about reform that we can apply. And we, just in the last century, uh, the suffrage movement unfolded in a climate of widespread anxiety, uh, the rise of the second Ku Klux Klan, where the governors of Ohio, of uh, Oregon, Colorado, Texas, and Georgia were members of the Klan. Five million Americans, perhaps, were, were members of it, uh, starting in 1915, running through the late 20s. Uh, the suffrage movement reached its apex uh, when, Wilson, when Woodrow Wilson was finally convinced to, to throw his support to, to the amendment. And that had not been because suddenly Woodrow Wilson woke up one morning and decided to do the right thing. It was the end result of a concerted campaign, a civil rights campaign, of pressure directly applied to the President of the United States, Alice Paul in particular, uh, took up residence in Lafayette Square across from the White House. Uh, they stood vigil outside the White House gates so that Woodrow Wilson had to see the protesters every day. In the midst of a State of the Union address, they unrolled a, a, a banner saying votes for women in the chamber of, of, the, of Congress. And so the success of the suffrage movement, the success of the civil rights movement, the success of the abolition movement, the success of uh, the uh, gay rights movement, has not been because everybody sat around and waited. It's been 
people have been watchful, intentional, active, intelligent about picking their spots and bearing witness to the idea that America is strongest when it is just and when we more generously interpret the central Jeffersonian assertion that we're all created equal. And it took to Seneca Falls uh, in 1848 for uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and others to say that it was all men and women who were created equal. But that was a fundamental insight. It was a fundamental cause. And that spirit of reform, that spirit of organized protest, is one that has made America better. I'd argue has made America great, and I think it can again. Well, and so what do you see as the role of both historians and the fourth estate in these times? Well, the historian's role, I think, uh, to paraphrase Faulkner, is to remind people of what has worked and what has not worked in the past and let people apply those lessons as they will to the the problems of the current time. History is a particular discipline. Uh, It's not, it should not be weaponized politically. Uh, But I do believe, at least for my, (laughs) as the Bible says, for me in my house, I want my work to be relevant to people who are struggling through what Marianne Evans, who wrote under the name George Eliot in the Victorian era, called the dim lights and tangled circumstance of the world. I think that history is illuminating. It's not a GPS. It's not a a roadmap. If you do these three things that FDR did, you'll get a new deal. It's, It's not like that. But it is a diagnostic guide. It does give you a sense of what the symptoms might mean. And then as far as as the journalists of the present go? Well, it's a, in a weird way, it's a, a terrifying era for journalists economically. Uh, the, the, all, the, all the familiar infrastructure of, of the business is changing rapidly, and we're not sure what it's changing into exactly. But it's kind of a golden era for reporting and commentary. Uh, public interest in public life has rarely been as high. One of the issues we have to resolve and, and, and work on is... Too many Americans have decided that they have picked a team politically, and they then seek out and only trust reporting and commentary that seems to affirm their pre-existing views. We're not being as true to the spirit of the founding, which was the idea that reason should have a chance with passion in the arena, Uh, the Enlightenment notion that inherited authority, superstition, divine right of kings, that all of that belonged to a different uh, former era, and that the new order of the ages was that the life of the mind could inform the life of the body politic. And I think that uh, journalists now have a uh, continuing responsibility to try to bring new facts, bring new evidence to bear, And I think it's up to the citizens to decide what to do with those facts and data. But my hope is that ultimately the role of reason continues to to be protected and perpetuated. Amen. John Meacham, uh, thank you again so much. Thanks so much. And now we turn to our first panelist, Ashley Lutheran. She's a reporter at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, covering crime and breaking news when she is not researching gun violence as part of a Marquette University O'Brien Fellowship in Public Service. And, uh, you know, as part of the Fourth Estate, welcome. Uh, Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. Again, my name is Ashley Lutheran. I'm a reporter for the journal Sentinel. I thought um, I was asked to speak on this panel and to speak on the importance of research and facts in investigative journalism. So I'm going to try to give you basically a working understanding of how I do my job and how my colleagues at the journal Sentinel do our job. Um, I think we're all set. I think you have to... The blank thing. Okay. All right. (laughs) 
Um, so just to start off with, oh, I'm gonna time myself so that I <laughs> stick to our time. Um, anyone who is a reporter can be an investigative journalist. It's not like there's some fancy hierarchy. If you are probing deeper into a subject or a matter and you're specifically focusing on the how and the why, and frankly, more recently, the who, who is behind something, who is making these decisions, you're an investigative reporter. And so, you know, the process is pretty similar to regular reporting. You know, you're starting with a question, something you want to know. And you have to think about what do you need to accomplish the story? What sources, what documents, what kind of evidence do you need to really understand what's going on? Um, and again, I'm going to sort of walk you through an investigation that I published with a colleague last year. Um, it was called The Intimidator. Um, it was about witness intimidation in the criminal justice system. A lot of the work that I do is focused on public safety and on crime reporting. So we sort of, my colleague John Diedrich and I, we started off uh, wondering how prevalent is witness intimidation? We had been hearing a lot about it. We had been seeing some uh, criminal charges being issued against people who were accused of intimidating witnesses. And so we had this really high profile case come about in 2015. It was the case of a man named Antonio Smith. He was criminally charged in one, in one original homicide, then with a second homicide of killing a witness to the first one. And then he was later charged with attempting to have a, a second witness to the first homicide killed. And so we have this compelling example, right? So what are we going to need? We're gonna need interviews with people investigating the case, interviews with people affected by it, victims' families. We're gonna need police reports. We're gonna need court documents. In this case, we have um, a lot of digital records. We have a lot of recordings, right, of jail calls, of videos, of things that the investigators themselves used. And, you know, what's our time frame? We're kind of, you know, in this age of dwindling resources, we have to think about what's our minimum story and what's our maximum story. That's something we're always asking ourselves now. Our minimum story is sort of a, hey, this is a one-off, interesting case that sort of illustrates a, a problem. A maximum story is really diving in, explaining what's going on, what are some of the factors in um, the lives of the people affected by this, in the places where these things are occurring, and also what's happening in the criminal justice system. So we wanted to look at data and we wanted to try to give some context to this. So we are looking at, um, we were looking at CCAP, our online court system, and we decided to do snapshots in time. We're looking at 2005 and 2015, which was kind of a good bookend because of the uh, time frame in which the events in the story took place. And it also had a, a before and after of 2007 when Milwaukee County made some changes about witness protection. And so we pulled cases from CCAP. We um, worked with our one of our data reporters, Kevin Crow. He pulled out a list of about, I think it was close to between 200 and 250 cases. And then John and I spent weeks going through and looking at you know, the online court records, entering in data, and doing some analysis. And we were able to show that you know, in 2015, prosecutors charged nearly 190 people with witness intimidation, which was a 250% increase from a decade before. And we looked at it qualitatively. So these cases are resulting in lower rates of dismissals, more convictions, and longer sentences. That is three paragraphs in a six-part series that took weeks to do. <laughs> I mean, granted, we were working on other things, but just, just for a sense of that. Um, when it came time to publish, we had to check all the facts. Every reporter kind of has a different style. I like to physically print out my draft of the story. I go through with a red pen. I sort of underline every single independent fact, and then I go to the primary document or the primary source for that information, and I check it. I literally put a check mark on it. Some people, um, depending on you know, what you're working with, they will do even more in-depth um, sort of you know, track notes, that sort of thing in Word documents. You also want someone to double check your analysis. So Kevin, who I mentioned before, you know, he took a look at the work that we did with the spreadsheet to make, and he basically recreated the, what we did and got the same answer. So that's also extremely important in these cases. And then um, you always wanna focus on the story, but you really wanna focus on your visuals and your graphics because that's where a lot of errors can kind of slip in unnoticed, especially because they're being usually um, kind of put together all in a package by someone who may not be as familiar with the material as the primary reporters. So you really need to make sure to fact check those. 
This is something you'll see in just about every single investigation um, by any reputable news organization at this point in time. It's, we call it the nerd box. It's basically how we did it. And like these are all the sources we use. This was our time frame. Um, especially with narrative stories, you're seeing things at the bottom like explaining what the notation in the stories mean. So, you know, italics are used when paraphrasing a quote based on other documentation or a person's recollection. Direct quotes are taken from in your interviews or transcripts or were witnessed in person. Um, some other examples of showing your work, I have some links up here and I'm, I'm sure we can get those out to you if you're interested. One I would just highlight is the Washington Post has gotten a lot of praise, deservedly so, for creating a database of fatal police shootings across the country. And one thing that they are very good at is they make that data set available to anyone. So if you were interested, you could run your own analysis, other journalists could do that. And you can also, in the process, check their work and their conclusions. Uh, I just wanted to touch briefly on anonymous sources. I'm sure we're going to talk about this more in the panel discussion. But some of the things you need to evaluate as a journalist before you use them, you know, is the information important and newsworthy? Is the source credible? Does this person have a compelling reason to be anonymous? Are they fear fearful for their safety? Are they fearful for losing their job, their livelihood? Um, could their family members be put at risk? And then you have to think about, is there any other way I can get this information? Um, and then just generally, I was asked to talk about the future. And I would just like to, I, I think the future really is collaboration among media organizations. You can see it at all different levels of reporting. Um, this past summer, I did a story working with some outstate uh, reporters within our Gannett network, where we surveyed local pharmacy, well, <laughs> not just local, we actually surveyed about 400 pharmacies across the state of Wisconsin to see what those pharmacists would say when we asked if we could get Narcan and if we needed a prescription for that. So Narcan re reverses an opioid overdose. It's supposed to be widely available under the state standing order that we've had for two years. And what we found was that nearly a quarter of pharmacists gave us inaccurate information or didn't have any idea what we were talking about. And so that, that's just one example of collaboration. Another one that is really interesting, like a lot of these records cost a lot of money. And so in the state of Texas, a lot of, which has some great investigative journalists and some great uh, news organizations, I, more than, between six and eight all went together recently to purchase voter registration data so that they can run analysis on voter turnout, who's being purged from the rolls, um, wh how are things changing? And they couldn't do that unless they partnered together. So I think really, as we're talking about the future of investigative journalism, um, you're going to see a lot more collaboration coming from that. So, and I have, that's it. So, <laughs> I hope that was okay. So I know we'll get to more questions for everybody, but I wanted to just ask you, how do you determine the credibility of an anonymous source? What are some of the steps that you would go through to say, yes, this person is worthy of being quoted, and yes, also worthy of being kept anonymous? Yeah, so a lot of people, I think a lot of people uh, assume that anonymous means that they are, an anonymous source is anonymous to the reporter. And to, if you are quoting them, that person should not be anonymous to you because you have no way to vet their credibility, how they would have firsthand knowledge of this information, um, what, their, you know, what their potential motive or biases may be. Now, there, there are times where you just get a call, and this has happened to me many times before. You get a call, you pick it up, it's from a block number, someone says, I think you should look into this, you have a conversation with that person, you don't know who they are, but you ask, what's the documentation here, what records should I be requesting? And you can go get those records and have the story right there. And you're attributing that information to those documents, those other public records that came from a tip. In the journal, at the Journal Sentinel, our policy is if we are quoting information and we are citing it to, um, a not, if we are citing it to anonymous sources, we always try to say, first of all, why they are anonymous, right, uh, to sources, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of some specific examples. We've had some of this come up in breaking news situations that I've covered where, uh, you know, we are getting information about people involved, for example, in breaking in, in crime, and we have to know who the person is that's giving us that information. And our policy is 
uh, we have to, at least one editor needs to know who that person is as well. So there are at least two people on staff who know who that person is so that they can have a good idea again of the, how, how does this person know this thing? And also, we require at least two independent ones to go with any of that kind of information. And they can't be, it can't be the kind of thing where we're pretty sure they, they, like, they talk to each other, right? They have to have, have independent knowledge of something if we're going to use it. All right. Well, up next is Amy Waldman, who is also a journalist, but is also a reference librarian. And it's kind of an interesting, you know, talking about the resources that journalists use and anyone else. Um, Amy is an adult reference librarian at the Milwaukee Public Library, also a former full-time award-winning news reporter and a current freelance writer, editor, and personal blogger. She's written on a wide range of issues, including mental health, education, personal finance, religion, all things book related, well you are a librarian, and music. Uh, her feature articles, book, music reviews, and essays appeared in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, The Shepherd Express, Milwaukee Magazine, The Wisconsin Jewish Chronicle, The Forward, Publishers Weekly, People, Reader's Digest, and Haaretz. She was a reporter and editor for the Marshfield News Herald and a staff reporter for Community Newspapers Incorporated. And she's going to speak to us today about how to find those credible sources. Amy, welcome. Thanks. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, and I also just want to um, acknowledge our city librarian, Paula Kiley, and our deputy city librarian, Joan Johnson, who were really supportive of this event and said, yes, go do this. Um, need these. So librarians and journalists, we share a reverence for reliable, unbiased information. Our goal is end users able to make informed decisions about whatever they're looking to become more informed about. Historically, the best and most respectful way we've helped make that happen is by doing everything we can to ensure access to high quality, objective source material. But the reality of our current digital ecosystem is this. Old school media companies citizen journalists, aka bloggers, governments, nonprofit organizations, political parties, paid trolls, unpaid trolls, and others, including libraries, are in constant competition for eyeballs and clicks. <laughs> this, in turn, has created angst and confusion for many of the possessors of those eyeballs and clicking devices. Not everyone has time to visit the library, although I, I highly recommend it, <laughs> or make friends with a reputable reporter, also a fine idea. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a few basic tools to ease the confusion. Um, the first comes from a pedagogy class I took when I was teaching. The instructor quoted his father, who was also a teacher. Know your stuff, he said, and know who you're stuffing. <laughs> It served me well, both as a journalist and a librarian. But if you change that to, what is this stuff? And who's doing the stuffing? You've got a basic formula for vetting information. That, some common sense, and a counterintuitive trick will be very helpful in figuring out whether what you're looking at is information gold or information pyrite. So let's first talk about common sense. If it seems too out there to be true, trust your instincts. If you're thinking of sharing it, trust your instincts and verify. People's motives aren't always pure, and purveyors of disinformation and misinformation know how to push your buttons. Um, also, somebody please remember to ask me about deep fakes during the Q&A. If you share, share with a brief explanation and cite your source so that others can verify. The crap test. This was developed in 2004 for college students preparing to write research papers. Determining the currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose of what you're looking at, though, is more easily grasped using a different set of metrics. Taking bearings and reading laterally. These come from a 2017 study by the Stanford History Education Workgroup. 
Sam Weinberg and Sarah McGrew observed undergraduate students, PhD historians, and professional fact checkers searching for information on social and political issues and evaluating live websites. The fact checkers blew the other groups out of the water, speedily and accurately assessing reliability. They achieved it by leaving the sites they were on and searching other sites to reality check what they were looking at. IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, has a great infographic with eight tips on spotting fake news, one of which, check the author, includes engaging in lateral reading, encouraging users to do a quick search on the author. Are they credible? Are they real? But lateral reading is broader than that, and I'm going to show you. So, let's say you're on Facebook and your aunt has posted this link to a documentary about surrogate motherhood. You click the link, and it takes you to an article on a site called cbcnetwork.org. CBC, of course, brings to mind the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, or it did for me. But this CBC is the Center for Bioethics and Culture Network, which sounds fancy, but also kind of vague. So I go to the About page. Its 503C credentials are splashed along the bottom of the page, but something about it doesn't feel quite right. I'm reading the About page. It says, the most vulnerable among us for our shared human future and human flourishing. Kind of coded language, raising some questions. And what's with calling it surrogate motherhood instead of surrogate parenthood? So off I go to Google. I entered the name into a Google search box, and a link to SourceWatch appears on the first name of results, the first page, which lists Jennifer C. Lal as the group's founder and executive director. I also do a cursory search of SourceWatch and find out it's a project of the Center for Media and Democracy. More later on that. Now I'm going to search on Jennifer Lal. Four pages in, and notice that I don't stop on the first page, because Google ranks its results, so the most popular and the most paid for are going to come up first. You want to go deeper in. And I find a link to a podcast she did with the president of the Colson Foundation, and several sites that link to religious-themed blogs and events. So I click on Colson, because I remember Watergate. And I now have a good handle on where the Center for Bioethics and Culture Network fits into the information landscape. Religious, probably right-leaning. Its founder has some scientific credentials, but is using that background and those credentials in the service of a particular point of view. SourceWatch also represents a particular point of view. But its site puts those views front and center and includes hyperlinks to information on its founders and to the Center for Media and Democracy. Which is not to say that either of these are necessarily better or worse than the other. It just gets back to that question of what is this stuff and who's doing the stuffing? Hmm. Asking and looking for answers to those questions, especially when you think you already know them, will take you a long way toward becoming a more confident navigator of an evolving information landscape and a more consume, informed consumer of information. And of course, you always cite your sources. <laughs> and <laughs> I was a little dog heavy, so I would... had to put a cat in there, the curiosity, yes. Um, Before we on, move on to Young Me, uh, Amy, I wanted to ask you, how do we navigate our own biases when we search for information? Is it is simply being aware that we have them enough? Um, simply being aware that we have them is, it's a great first step. It's like, you know, like if I don't know I have a problem, right, I don't have a problem. So knowing that you have them is, is great. The next step is to always check your biases. And also, especially if you read something and you react strongly to it, that's the most important moment to go, what's happening here? Um, the most often retweeted, reshared emotion, can anybody guess? Anger. Yeah, rage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And 
there are people out there, they're, they're going to try to push your buttons to get you to push your, push your buttons and share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay. We will come back to that. But now we will hear from Professor Youngmi Kim. She is in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication and a faculty affiliate at the Department of Political Science at UW-Madison. Her research concerns media and politics in the age of data-driven digital media, and specifically the role that digital media play in political communication amongst political leaders, non-party groups, or otherwise known as issue advocacy groups, and citizens. She's testified at the Federal Election Commission's hearing on the rulemaking of internet communication disclaimers, and she's presented her research and provided expert opinions at the congressional briefings on foreign interference in elections, the Honest Ads Act, and other technology policy matters. Professor Kim. Thank you. Um, so it's nice to be uh, here. Um, and then today I'll talk about a foreign interference in election focusing on voter suppression campaigns. Um, yeah, so, oh, sorry. Yes, sorry. So I'm, I'm presenting uh, the, some of the research findings uh, by uh, the project data, digital ad tracking and analysis, um, which is uh, in a disciplinary research group that I lead uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, so, project data consistent, uh, consists of a communication scholars, uh, media scholars, and computer science people, statisticians, and political scientists. Uh, and recently, we added a sociologist as well. Um, and then uh, we track um, digital ads and analyze digital ads, like especially during the election campaigns. Um, but uh, when I first proposed this idea like back in 2014, uh, nobody actually believed me. So when I sent out like, dozens of grant proposals, uh, almost all of them uh, got rejected. Oh, like digital media is a great place. Like why you think it's a dark place? Um, but in fact, uh, well, the, one of the reasons I think you know, that digital media uh, ha have a potential problems and a dark aspect of it is because uh, the ad, digital uh, ad, uh, so sometimes it's called like a dark post, uh, meaning that uh, these ads are not publicly accessible. So for example, this is uh, the, the left side, oh, sorry. This, this one, um, is one of the ads we found from our data, uh, and it, it, you know, it's a typical fear-mongering uh, type of ads, like anti-Muslim ads, and then see, and uh, refugees are coming onto, uh, coming around the world. Uh, if you go to their sponsor page, which is uh, publicly available, you're never gonna find this uh, ad post because even though it looks like it's just like a regular post, it is a sponsored paid ad that are designed to appear to targeted individuals only. So that posed a lot of challenges for us to track and then collect the data. So I was literally, you know, hanging my hat on the wall, uh, and then uh, I just like, you know, realized that okay, what about uh, a tool, the user-based tool that tracked uh, digital ads um, in real time? Um, so we developed the app. Uh, called like an e scope, like an election scope. Um, so this is actually, uh, I'm gonna skip all this, I like, get, uh, you know, technical details, but it just works like an ad blocker. But instead of uh, uh, blocking the ads, it automatically detects ads and then transfers ads to my research server. Um, <laughs> and it is, because it is based on the users, like, it is really important to have like, a representative, like a uh, pool of users. Uh, for example, like a ProPublica investigative journalism organization developed a similar app okay, in 2017 after the election, like after we discovered like, uh, the Russian interferences. Uh, but, <laughs> but, um, but um, because probably the name, um, and then people know that uh, maybe like a news media like investigative journalist that like, have some liver of slant. Uh, you know, there are some assumptions about that. So, so uh, the, their tool uh, was not able to capture 
enough number of like, a conservative uh, ads that targeted conservative voters. Uh, so we uh, tried to sample like, a people uh, who represented uh, the U.S. voting age population. So in 2016 campaigns, we collected 87 million ads exposed to 17,000 uh, people representing the U.S. voting age population. And then also I want to note that uh, we collected the data two weeks prior to primary election elections uh, in each state uh, and uh, six weeks uh, for six weeks like a prior to like an election day general election day uh, so I'm gonna just note that that falls uh, and uh, FPC window, so-called FPC windows, like you know, if any political action committees or uh, candidate committees, of course, like if you do like political, put some political ads, uh, especially like you know, expressing uh, support or defeat a candidate, then you have to file a report to FPC later. Okay, so. What we found interesting, what we found is that it's actually uh, more than half of the groups we focused uh, were suspicious groups, uh, meaning that these groups do not have, did not have any um, public footprint. So we actually start to go, we quickly realized that, well, I, I assume that like, there will be a lot of like, you know, dark money groups, but um, we realized that most of the groups do not are not like a FAC groups. So, so the groups who filed the reported FAC, when we matched their, our sponsors to the sponsors found in FAC data, uh, Federal Election Commission, um, that was only 3.5%. Uh, so the majority of the groups are non FAC groups. Uh, not only that, uh, when we found that like, the groups are not found in FAC, we moved uh, down to like, IRS data. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe it's a 51C34, um, 610, uh, it's like a nonprofit organizations. Uh, if we don't find any registration uh, based on the IRS uh, Based, uh, IRS based databases, then we move to other research sources, media watched organizations databases, or uh, fact checking organization databases. Just, uh, just to want to know, like, you know, is this group like, known to the public? Um, and then, like, still, if we didn't have any information, we classify them as like, suspicious groups. And then, uh, remember, we collected the ad data in real time. Uh, so. Our team had like, no idea who these suspicious groups are. For example, because they don't have any public footprint, this is one of the examples of a suspicious group. Uh, generally, suspicious groups they have a very generic name. Um, so it's basically just Americans for America. Um, and uh, they describe it in a, you know, like a community or organization. Uh, so for example, this one is like a community for people who think like a particular candidate should be in a jail. Um, or, uh, you know, people who care about America. Uh, so it's very uh, generic description that didn't uh, add a lot of information about the groups, even though we you know, researched the, uh, the mission of those organizations. Um, so there was no way we could uh, dig out more about these groups. So we set aside all these suspicious groups for, for about a year. Um, and then later, 2017, when House Intel Committee, House Intelligence Democratic Committee, uh, released uh, uh, Russian ads with the, their meta information, we matched that information with uh, the information of our suspicious groups. And it turned out, uh, one out of six our suspicious groups turned out to be a criminal link to Russian groups. Uh, and then remember one thing, when, uh, you know, probably you read like a newspaper uh, Friday, uh, no, yes, yeah, yesterday. <laughs> so um, there could be more. So, like, so the initial the, uh, release of the house into data only included uh, internet research agency who paid like, ads in rubles. Uh, so, and what we found is like a, a network of suspicious groups who are interlocked with the domestic actors. Um, these are some ads that we found as uh, suspicious groups, veterans before illegals, and if you think our veterans must can't get benefit before refugees, so which one is Russian? So one of them turned out to be Russian groups ad. It's hard to know, right? So this one. This one is Russian group, and this one is a suspicious group's ad. 
Um, and then these are uh, other suspicious groups who are nonprofits who did not file a report to the FAC groups. So basically they emphasize uh, division within the public and oppose the threat uh, and emphasize the, uh, the conflict uh, within the society, um, things like that. Um, and the volume of the ads generated by anonymous groups, that includes the suspicious groups and the suspicious Russian groups, and Russian groups and then AstroTurf, non-profits who did not file a report to FEC, altogether was four times larger than uh, that of FEC groups. Uh, and many of the suspicious groups, including Russians, uh, shared a few number of news sources, meaning that like, they are sharing almost the same, like a two or three, like the same news outlets. Um, so it was like interesting. Um, anonymous, anonymous, anonymous groups, like non-FPC groups, clearly targeted battleground states. Uh, and uh, Wisconsin, uh, Pennsylvania, and Virginia uh, were the high, most highly targeted states uh, in back, uh, in back in 2016. Yeah. And then, um, I just want to just to remind uh, about this, like Wisconsin and like you know Pennsylvania. Those are the two states uh, that used to be uh, strong Democratic strongholds, but turned to uh, Trump um, with a razor thin margin. So I'm not claiming any like causal inferences. Like there, we don't know whether like as made like election outcomes are different. Uh, but just to, to give you a, a context, so. 8% of the Pennsylvanians that like, received some of these uh, suspicious ads. Um, and then vote margin, Trump vote margin in like, Pennsylvania was 0.7%. So uh, Wisconsin, uh, about 3% of Wisconsin, Wisconsin residents received some suspicious ads. Uh, and then vote margin was 0.8%. Uh, so uh, just to stop there. And then, um, we also found other like, targeting patterns. Um, so compared to the national average of the U.S. voting age population, uh, low-income families whose household like, below $40,000 uh, received 20% more immigration ads um, and 35% more racial conflict ads. Um, and then medium income range like, received 25% uh, percent more nationalism as like America first uh, types of or alt-right uh, ads. Uh, there is also some targeting patterns in terms of a race. Uh, so white uh, voters were targeted like, about 45% more with the immigration and the nationalism ad compared to non-white uh, users. One thing I just want to emphasize is that, on the other hand, like, it looks like a different ethnic, uh, racial ethnic groups that like, received different types of ads. So for example, non-white voters are overwhelmingly received uh, the voter suppression uh, campaigns. Uh, and especially uh, early on, like before, um, early on like 2016, their ads are almost always like talking about uh, racial uh, ethnic identity identity and celebrating their cultures and things like that, but like in the months before the election, suddenly it became really political. And then a night before the voting day, election day, uh, they said, like, you know, boycott the election. So boycott the election, this particular ad like, targeted uh, African Americans. Um, and again, this ad, like all, the, and all these groups were about just, you know, Beyonce and, like, you know, or dancers and um, kind of thing. Um, there, uh, or um, on the election day, like a very early morning, like a 3 a.m., these had uh, popped up uh, targeting, again, African Americans, uh, say, I did not vote uh, because only um, our candidate deserved the trust of a king, and so nobody, no candidate will serve like a black voters. Um, this is, um, this is, these ads are found on Twitter. So this is a typical like a deception type of voter suppression. So you can vote uh, from home, avoid the long lines, uh, or you know, tweet your vote, uh, hashtag Hillary, then you know, your ballot 
tweet uh, counts as ballot um, type of thing. So, so that is, those are particularly targeting Hispanic voters. Okay, so why we have all of these problems? Um, one thing is the nature of this data-driven algorithm-based digital media. Uh, because as I briefly explained earlier on, digital ads are completely hidden from uh, the public unless collected in real time by the users who is exposed to messages. So it posed incredible challenges for researchers and journalists and investigators to monitor uh, political ads. Um, now, I could, you know, since um, End of May, like May 24th, uh, like Facebook like launched the uh, new transparency measures and political ad archives, but uh, I have so many complaints about that. Uh, so I still have a lot of limitations. Um, and uh, yeah, so self-regulation transparency measures are important first to staffs, uh, but uh, still far behind uh, uh, and the far, um, you know, combating against the malicious actors like foreign uh, actors. Um, and another reason I want to emphasize is uh, multi-level multi legal loopholes. Currently, there is no law uh, provides uh, guidances or policies uh, for digital political advertising. Um, FEC is uh, very inconsistent about disclaimer guard guidelines. Um, so um, back in 2011, and Google and Facebook lobbied really hard and arguing that you know, digital ads are such a small items, so it should be uh, uh, considered as a bumper stickers. Uh, so uh, if we put a lot of information, such as paid for by uh, Make America Number One uh, pack, uh, that would take a lot of spaces, therefore it will uh, have, a, it will just against like a freedom of speech of the speakers. Uh, my argument is that these days, uh, uh, not the speakers, but the receivers or voters have a lot of like, a burden because we're getting like a, uh, Hundreds of ads, uh, hundreds of ads a day, uh, and then you know we need to figure out who are authentic like, users and uh, you know domestic actors versus the like, foreign actors and things like that. Um, fundamental reason is that like, since the Citizens United um, a whole like a campaign finance law uh, got really messed up. Uh, so it opened the door for election campaign interventions by any individual or groups, uh, and um, including nonprofits and corporations, and as an oversight, uh, even foreign entities. Uh, because foreign actors always been like prohibited uh, from like doing campaigning. They have to register. There's a FATA. Uh, but uh, it's just hard to monitor like foreign influences. Uh, I'll just uh, stop here and then continue uh, to continue to discuss the problems and the challenges and the solutions uh, the Q and section. Dr. Kim, thank you so much. Um, before we move on to Dr. Shapiro, I, I just want to say one of the things that I think maybe I certainly am feeling looking at this, and maybe everyone else is too, it's like, how on earth do I do my due diligence? How, how do I protect myself, and how do I be an informed voter when all of this is happening in the background? You know, I hate to say this, uh, but that's like a most frequently asked questions. Um, but um, yes, yeah, like in the long term, we need to educate ourselves in the media literacy uh, or source verification. Um, those should be taught, uh, and we should have a curriculum for that. Uh, but frankly speaking, it is really, really hard to uh, catch suspicious actors. Uh, you know, I. Um, when we first like, found like, Russian groups and suspicious groups, uh, and when actually when I, we didn't know that uh, these suspicious groups are Russian, I, even though I had like, a really you know, strong gut feeling that these are Russians, um, I talked to a New York Times reporter, and then he didn't believe that these are suspicious groups because it looked like very sophisticated. Um, I don't believe that Russians uh, did like, a sophisticated targeting. Um, but 
these are turned out to be Russians. Um, so, and then what my analysis like, showed is that because Russians uh, had intimate understanding of the US politics and the campaigns and the digital media, and then um, especially the cleverest uh, existing uh, society. So they are just to exploit the division, the already existing society, and targeting both extremes by sending different messages and so the division with uh, on with masquerade identity. So it's just uh, hard to track that. So I think the solution is actually transparency uh, at the um, platform level, but uh, more importantly, um, the Congress uh, level. So we need a policy for uh, transparent uh, and accountable campaign practices. All right, thank you. I'm sure we'll talk more about it after, but we'll move now to our last speaker, Dr. Amy Shapiro. She's the director of the philosophy department here at Alverno College. She's also co-director of the Alverno College Women's and Gender Studies program. Her research is primarily in women, gender epistemology, and Holocaust studies. Her present interest is in women's education, pedagogy, com contemplative studies, food studies, and neuroplasticity, which is one of my new favorite words. I, I really like that. Um, so Dr. Shapiro is going to talk to us about how to be discerning critical thinkers. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> After all of okay? this. Yeah. Closer. Uh, I, I didn't warn people that giving the philosopher the last position <laughs> on a panel is really a problem. I have a lot to say. Um, and one of the things, oh, yeah. thank you, Bonnie. Yep. Um, one of the things that strikes me is that, that uh, when I talk to students about voting, uh, I uh, tell them to disregard all ads, that they need to go to sites that, that really speak to the candidates' positions. And this is really a new idea to them because they're used to um, the, the, being on uh, social media and the, the very ads that Young Me has just talked about. So I just want to say uh, there is no better place in the world to talk about critical thinking than at Alverno College. And I am biased. I am very pleased this is happening here. But the reason I say that is, is that we teach students critical thinking first and foremost. And we do that developmentally. So I'm drawing on the work of my colleagues from uh, around 1972 where we have refined and developed the, the uh, teaching the pedagogy here to really think carefully about how we're developing um, the, the minds of our of future leaders. I believe the first step in critical thinking is having a clear understanding that there's a difference between opinion and fact and we have the ability as humans to discern the differences. It's not easy though and that's one of the things about critical thinking is, is that it is a hard practice. When we think about critical thinking, we have a tendency to think about what we're looking at, um, what's the object of our thought. So opinions and, and facts and information um, are the, the object of critical thinking. But critical thinking involves as much in terms of our approach to what we are discerning and what we believe we know as it does what we are examining or thinking about. So our own need to, to make a judgment comes from a place um, often of emotions and preferences. And uh, I think we've already mentioned that it's really, really important for people to be aware of where their, um, the, where their starting point is, what their, what their assumptions are, what they want to see. So I believe the, really, the first thing a good critical thinker requires is humility and curiosity. Because I'm a philosopher, I talk to my students a lot about what the origins of their knowledge is, where, the, where their perceptions come from. And most of them, um, and most of us, think of knowledge as information, data, and facts. And we've just you know, heard a lot of information, data, and facts, um, when in fact knowledge works with information, knowledge, and uh, data, and facts. It's not the same as it. So the first order of business for a good critical thinker is to, refl to reflect on how we know what we think we know. And this then involves, I, I'm told I'm a philosopher, awareness of the sense that we believe we know something. Then it requires reflection on how we got there. 
So we have to go backwards when we're engaging critical thinking. We have to think back to where we started and how we got to what we think we know. So I mentioned humility and curiosity because part of being a really good critical thinker is accepting the idea that we are always learning and there's always more to know about the world. And I, actually, I think this is a very foreign concept in the world that we're in today. Um, and therefore, I, what I think I know may be limited and it might even be erroneous. If I start there, um, I will have a very, a, a much better chance of um, approaching and understanding what it is I'm reasoning through. Tolerance for the possibility that we only know a little bit about a lot will allow us to engage the kinds of practices and critical thinking that will lead us to ongoing, ongoing, ongoing discernment. We have to be aware that thinking is hard. It's really hard. It's complex. And, and it's one of the reasons why, because it's so complex, we have to teach it. And we have to teach the, the individual dimensions of it. Um, and that we have, a, we have a tendency to draw conclusions uh, without any kind of inquiry. Uh, and, and, and actually the RAND report talks quite a bit, a bit about this in, in the terms of the ways in which people have biases and then what they do is they go out and they look for corroboration. It, by, by the way, that RAND report is fascinating. So question asking, which was raised by a number of people, or maybe even everybody on the panel, then becomes a process for proceeding. And the more we inquire, the better able we are to discern and then to ask more questions. And I'm sure the students in the room are like, oh God, Amy, not that again. <laughs> um, but you know, you gotta ask questions. So question asking might mean finding out more information, but that's really not the critical thinking dimension. It also involves asking about meaning and the implications of ideas and positions, or um, as we've just seen, what, what are we looking at? We have to look at what the, what the consequence is. So this, this goes back to humility. An idea that knowledge is something we are in an ongoing relationship to, that others are knowledgeable, and that to paraphrase a character in Toni Morrison's book, Song of Solomon, it's the, one of my favorite characters in literature, Pilot. She says, if I could have known more people, I would have loved more people. And I'm taking that quote and I'm saying, if I could know more people, I would know more. <laughs> so I'd be remiss if I, as a feminist, didn't mention that we live in a world that is driven by an androcentric narrative of the supreme value of winning. And the context means everything here. And I, I have to say that I think, I'm sorry for those of you who are big sports fans, but sports plays into this in really profound ways. It sets us up to think in, in ways and, uh, and the, that, that winning really at all costs. The measure of success in our society has little to do with wisdom and integrity or knowledge and understanding or truth and justice and everything to do with winning. That's scary. As a result, we de-emphasize the value of intellectual engagement and collaborative leadership and decision-making, collaborative decision-making in favor of the power of being right and the idea that to be wrong is weak rather than a position from which we can gain knowledge and that, it, it, that being wrong is actually the, the position that has the most integrity. So at the end of Zora Neale Hurston's book, Their Eyes Were Watching God, which I think is a masterpiece of epistemology. It's a work of fiction. If you've never read it, it's remarkable. But as a book of, about epistemology, that is theory of knowledge, um, Tea Cake, the lover of the main character, Janie, tells Janie that she's wrong to think that the Indians are correct in believing a hurricane is coming. And I'm struck by uh, Amy's comment about trusting your intuition. He says, quote, Indians don't know much of nothing to tell the truth, else they'd own this country still, end quote. So there's a premise in his argument that ownership and winning are signs of intelligence and knowledge when they are, in this instance, the outcomes of particular values and ideologies that belong to the white patriarchal narrative. 
TK comes to judgment without realizing he has reasoned on false premises, that not everyone believes ownership of land is good or that ownership of land is even possible, namely the Indians, right? If he had been aware of his preconceptions and the ways he had ingested the dominant culture narrative, which is really something we all need to be truly deeply aware of, the way we ingest the dominant culture narrative, he might have been able to save his life. I'm sorry, I gave away the end. <laughs> you should still read it. <laughs> Hurston's work addresses issues of race, class, and gender, and the means we use to draw conclusions based on a belief that our knowledge is true because of our own experience. When in fact, we must bring to the fore reason. And I was struck by, this is something that John Meacham talked about at the that when, when we were listening at the very beginning. That is awareness of assumptions and premises and awareness of the desire to be right rather than to learn. In order to better understand the mystery of the world around us and our own experiences. And that they are just that, experiences that, which we treat as fact, but they're not, they're our experiences. So how do we use critical thinking to tell the difference between fact and opinion? I have no idea. <laughs> Just tell, I'm just saying up straight, right? <laughs> we first realized that though at times the distinctions might, they might be a bit blurry, and they are because they belong to different categories depending upon their contexts. So sometimes they're driven by personal differences. For instance, sorry, I'm gonna make you hungry. That's probably why we you know, provided the cookies earlier. Chocolate tastes good to me is a fact. But the statement chocolate tastes good is not a fact, but an opinion. Chocolate in large doses is bad for a dog. I can't believe I brought in dogs. I actually had a little thing about cats earlier, but I decided to leave it out. But chocolate in large doses is bad for a dog is a fact because we can identify data that shows how it affects a dog's brain. But I might have an opinion that chocolate is bad for a dog because I've seen how my dog was affected by an overdose of chocolate. That's an opinion. That might inspire me to inquire about a dog's reaction to chocolate so I can better understand the causes of the dog's response. Then we come to understand that there are frameworks, and this is how we talk at Alverno, and our students are really quite articulate on this subject. There are frameworks that belong to disciplines, or you could say theories that belong to disciplines that, that distinguish them from one another. So science and biology in particular are going to help me understand why chocolate is bad for my dog. Religion and sociology are not gonna tell me anything. <laughs> not about the dog and chocolate. And part of the point is that we are willing, if we are willing to be curious and have humility to make further inquiry, we might better understand the methodologies of different disciplines that help us reflect on the world around us. Critical thinking in this sense reminds us that different disciplines require different methodologies and approaches. And so if we're talking about climate change and we're talking about science, it's very different than if we're talking about religious opinions about climate change. That's a different methodology. It's a different set of assumptions and we need to be aware of that. We could talk about chocolate preferences, sorry, I keep you know, talking about chocolate. But more often than, than we realize the distinction, distinctions between fact and, and, and uh, opinion can result in life or death issues. And I'm thinking here in particular of some of our nursing students um, who have to understand the difference between fact and opinion, or the, otherwise they could kill their patients. So ultimately and finally, I wanna say what I think is most important about this, and that is that being a critical thinker involves a moral commitment. We teach here at Alverno College the process of valuing and decision making as an essential dimension to critical thinking. You have to make judgments. Discerning how individual and community values, say, influence perceptions, emotions, and perspectives. Moral imagination requires awareness of the complexity of human life in combination with analytical reasoning. Critical thinking is hard, not just because it involves examining the lens with which you examine and draw conclusions, Ooh. but also understanding that when one is making claims or judgments, they entail moral implications, always. 
Anyone who has been in the position of caring for a person or even an animal knows that coming to judgment about that individual's care carries weight and it requires careful consideration, observation, interaction, evaluation, and only then determining the best sort of care. And I might just say here that I have just described the developmental levels of our analysis ability. It is a carefully considered, if it is a carefully considered conclusion, it entails awareness of one's own preferences, desires, emotions, which I think is very important to critical thinking, but we have to be acutely aware of the role that it plays, and values. Living life with integrity requires humility in the face of one's limited knowledge. It's the only way to have integrity about that. Being aware that we all have a tendency to believe that we are our own source of knowledge will go a long way in helping us resist the idea that we are the only source of knowledge. <laughs> and if we enlist curiosity to consider the possibility that we don't know what others know, we will be much more effective as critical thinkers. Thank you. You, you mean we don't, I don't know everything? Is that what you're saying? Oh, wow. You don't. I don't. No, I oh, do, but you don't. Yeah. No. But you do, yes. <laughs> So I have a bunch of questions here, and I know I am kind of looking, uh, are we, noon is about our time? Is that, okay. So we have about a half hour to, to go over, and some of the questions are duplicates, uh, and I will do my best to, to get to all of them. But I, actually, there are three very similar questions from the audience that actually echo a question that I have too, which is that this is pretty much a self-selecting group. This is a group that already cares about this topic. How do we get people who don't think they care about this topic to pay attention to it? And that's kind of open to the panel. I mean, what, what are ways, this is, it's a huge amount of effort, as, as Dr. Shapiro was saying, to think critically, to make the effort to do the research that Amy was talking about at the library that Ashley has to go through every single time. Everyone's busy, everyone's tired. How do we, how do we get folks not in this room engaged in this process? So this is my question? Everybody, <laughs> okay. it's open to everyone. I mean, I, I will just start, the, I, um, I'm heavily involved with the Milwaukee Press Club and the Press Club Endowment, and that's something that we discuss and think about all the time, and it's, it's extremely difficult to, to think about that. In terms of journalism, the best thing that we can do to kind of get people to think about these things, our readers to do that, uh, people who are consuming the news that we are producing, is to be as transparent as possible and to take those extra steps to write the information in ways that meets the audience where they are. So we're starting to get, and you'll see other news organizations doing this, but you get to the point where you're, you're dropping these massive investigations. Uh, the New York Times Trump tax investigation is a good example. It was a massive, massive undertaking. They also created a kind of like skim version of that, right? Like seven key things you need to know. By being more transparent in that way and producing it for to reach a wider audience, I think you get more people consuming more reputable news information, but also being transparent about how you're doing your work. And that's something that journalists have been very bad at for a very long time, and we're only making baby steps at getting better at that. Yeah, so I, I tell people a lot that I'm the happiest public librarian in North America, but um, your question just made me realize that I'm also probably, like any public librarian, one of the luckiest, because Every day, people come into the library, and li people really trust librarians. I mean, people in general, I mean, there's people who don't trust anybody, but librarians are, you know, on the scale from used car salesmen to, you know, <laughs> we're, we're pretty, we're, we're doing okay. Um, so, I deal with the public, and I'm in a really good position when somebody asks me for help with a computer, or somebody asks me for help with something, I don't say, oh, I'm going to teach you some digital media literacy now. I'll just say, hey, so you're looking for this. Yeah, and don't stop here at page one. You want to go further. You want to put comma complaints next to your search. 
to see about an in something. You want to check. And so I think um, we're in a really good position to do that. And then hopefully some of those people go out and then they spread the word. So where you can engage somebody to talk to them, you want to take those opportunities. I don't have much more, sorry, about this, but. Right, so let's say, let's say somebody comes in and they're, they want to know about, um, I'm going to just show my bias here, because I worked at Milwaukee Area Technical College for years and years and years. And one of the things that I did was I would have students come in or people come in who were thinking of going and people who were thinking of doing things. And they would sometimes want say, yeah, and I'm going to enroll in Kaplan or one of the really, and again, I'm totally owning my biases here, these sleazy, horrible, <laughs> for-profit <laughs> colleges that just would take your money and give you nothing. And so what I would do is I would say, so put Kaplan comma complaints into the search box. And you would see what comes up, rip off reports, scam alert, blah, blah, blah. And you would put MATC comma complaints into the search box and you would get a generic like complaint form that was from MATC employee complaint form or something. And you could just, just now people know how to tweak results. So again, you want to go deeper in. But I had found that to be a really useful tool just to look at kind of anything. And sometimes you're going to just see somebody who's angry and bitter and has an ax to grind. But it's again, it's, it's using that humility and curiosity um, to judge and see what, what are you looking at and to make that determination. But it's a good tool to use in a search engine. Um, I just want to say, I think we make too many assumptions about what it is, about people thinking. And um, what we have to do is help people learn to think to discover how um, pleasurable it can be. But uh, very often, and I've seen this over and over again, I've been teaching for a long time, that um, st students, and you know, are, they're adults here, um, and they're from all different ages, are afraid because they don't think they have the ability to reason through. And all that they really need is understanding what the techniques are to do that. Uh, and I, it makes me think a number of years ago, it, had to, it has to be over 25 years ago, um, I had a student who had taken a course where uh, she, she was uh, very involved in, in gaming in northern Wisconsin, in uh, fishing and uh, you know, different kinds of activities. And she was very opposed to spearfishing. And in a class, very early on, she was asked to do research. And so she chose to research this because she thought she could prove her argument. And she was shocked at what she learned. This is part of the humility and curiosity I was talking about. I, I've used the student as sort of my model um, to discover that everything she, all her assumptions were completely wrong because of the research that she did, she'd done and she changed her position. And she couldn't wait to tell the world that this, you know, this happened to her because she understood the value of both her investigation and her capacity to reason it through. And that took precedence over her bias. And you know, she changed her position on going up north and, and being involved in gaming. One of the things I think is interesting, you talk about changing a position. That is something that our political process, we don't allow our politicians to change their minds. Mm -hmm. We don't allow them to, to be human mm -hmm. and to come to a different conclusion about something that they may have held very firmly mm -hmm. over here, but 20 years later they feel differently. So if we don't allow politicians to do that and people that we elect to represent us, you know, what hope is for the rest of us to, to hold that? Because we flip-flop, you know? We're, we're accused of, of not holding our principles strongly. Yeah, so I want to add on, uh, on that. So 
you know, information is uh, the currency for democracy, so we need to uh, acquire information. We need to follow, you know, what's going on around the world. I think in the past, we might have uh, emphasized too much um, you know, voters duty, I guess the civic duty, like, you know, as a voter to make an informed decision, you need to find information, you need to understand what's going on. But in the data-driven algorithm-based, like a digital media environment, uh, it's just hard to know, uh, hard to do, like spend time uh, to figure out uh, who they are, like what the sources are, true sources are, and then what this means, uh, and things like that. So I want to think about like you know the, the other side of the coin. So rather than uh, emphasizing uh, you know borders like duties, like we might want to emphasize borders right. It, we need to, we have a right to know, to know uh, who are trying to influence me. So, uh, th so that's that's like really something that we can demand. Then, like changes uh, in political campaigns, the way politicians uh, run the country, um, things like that. All right. Um, these questions are for for our two journalists, but. Certainly everyone else can weigh in too. Uh, a, a number of people wanted to know about the future of local reporting with all the mergers happening. Can we really afford in-depth investigations and you know, how, do, um, how do we deal with limited resources? And Ashley, what did you specifically mean by limited resources? Sure. So probably the most limited resource is the one that we all have, which is time. You're making time. Uh, and you talk about making decisions and having the ability to, to have the humility to put something away. Like you can invest a lot of time, research something, and it gets to a point where like you can't see, maybe you, the story just has too many holes or it's, it's not the right time or maybe, you know, you're, you're dealing with human sources, perhaps the degree of harm to publishing a, a story for, I'm thinking specifically of some stories I've done related to, to crime victims where it wasn't, you know, necessarily an absolute public's need to know the story. Um, you know, you just, you invest a lot of time with that person and interviewing them, but you, you realize that they're not quite ready for that commitment for that story to be public, right? Um, and I, I'm, like I said, I'm thinking specifically of, of one story I've covered. But in terms of limited resources and the future of local reporting, I mean, that's why you're seeing the Journal Sentinel and a lot of other news organizations focus on building up subscriber base, um, focusing on that. And also, <laughs> we're involved with a lot of uh, news initiatives. One of the largest is uh, called the Table Stakes Initiative, and that's really trying to look at um, how how newsrooms can survive in the future and continue to invest in things that are important to their communities. And so because of that, you're, you're seeing a lot more sort of picking and choosing of what we're covering. And I know a lot of people lament uh, some of the what they see as the lack of sort of daily um, bread and butter journalism. You know, perhaps we're not providing as much coverage as people would like of institutions. Um, but as our resources have declined, we are focusing more on larger issues, systemic issues, and trying to focus on that. And each person is sort of tasked with finding what is the most important, impactful story of the day. And sometimes, you know, being on the public safety beat, when I was more in the daily mix, I'm now on a fellowship and working at something more long term, but that is, you, you have to make those decisions every day. And sometimes there's just something that happens, um, like a high profile, high profile crime happens that obviously takes precedence. Um, but other days it's like, well, I have these four different things I could try to chase down and that's where you need to have a good collaborative approach with editors and other reporters that you trust to help figure out how best to cover those things. Or maybe it's not a daily story, maybe it's a story two weeks from now. I don't know if, I feel like I got far afield, I apologize. <laughs> So I'm going to take it from a slightly different um, angle and also start by saying I subscribe. We subscribe <laughs> to the Daily Paper. I actually subscribe to three papers. So um, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Journal Sentinel. But I think that journalism is in flux now. I don't think anybody really knows where it's going to land. So I think that that's, it's a particularly, um, 
challenging time to be in the news business. I think it's a particularly interesting time also. Um, but there's been a lot of scary stuff happening. There's a lot of consolidation. This consolidations means, frankly, less reporting. Um, it's, I think it's really important that the Journal Sentinel is doing the in-depth stories it's doing. Um, but there are really some good local sources, too, that are independently owned. There's um, Neighborhood News Service, which comes out of Marquette, um, is a really good urban source. Um, community Newspapers, which is a Journal Sentinel, um, they're owned by Journal Sentinel, and there's some hybrid, and there's some cross con things that happen in the papers. Um, Urban Milwaukee, which is Bruce Murphy's site, um, and Bruce did a lot of great citizen journalism. Um, so if you can look, and then find individual bloggers. There are good bloggers out there. Um, I don't do news blogging, I just write about whatever I want to write about. But I'm sourcing everything I write, and I'm hyperlinking. Um, look for those people and find those individual people that you trust. And, and it's out there. It's just, it's kind of the Wild West. It's interesting, you know, I just got back from the three weeks in Germany on this fellowship, and I think one of the resources that we don't, we kind of talk around it, it's money. And to, to give you an example, German democracy is very robust. It's a different model than ours. But their public broadcasting, so that's television and radio with the attending media, you know, um, public, uh, sorry, website, um, they get, not through government funding, it's through, like the BBC, a fee-based, every German pays, 8 billion euro a year for good ethical journalism. 8 billion euro, and they do not complain about it. They, they expect it. And so, I, I, you know, part of me coming back from that saying, because I keep saying that number keeps rattling around in my head, and I think, what, I think WWM, I think our budget is maybe 2 million, and that includes salaries, and, and I mean, and, and we get, and that's mostly, from people like you. I mean, that's either people subscribing or people becoming a member. Yeah, and, and so there, there's, there's a part of me that says, I, you know, I want to do, you know, journalism is that important to, be, to have that there, but we're not supporting it financially, and that's what we need. And, and for the Germans are. I, I have to step in here as a Holocaust scholar yeah. and point out that you're talking about Germany, mm -hmm. and n no one. No country understands better yes. what happens when the, the press is suppressed. And it, it's striking that you're talking about Germany. Um, what we have now in this country is not suppression, it's the demonizing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so this has become a huge problem. And for those of you who are interested, Christopher Browning, uh, who's a Holocaust scholar, has an amazing piece in the New York Review of Books, com not really comparing, but looking at the parallels between the rise of the Nazis and what's happening today. And he talks specifically about that shift away from the suppression of the press to the demonization. He doesn't use the word demonization, but that's pretty that much That and it. attrition. Yeah, exactly. And, and, well, and, and attrition, like just, yeah. just let them die, yeah. let, let well, the newspapers die, let whatever. Well, yeah. and, and Jamal Khashoggi is is a prime example. Yes. What happened mm -hmm. to him is a is the tip, I think, of something that could be really even worse. Yeah. I would offer one other thing too that the Journal Sentinel and I think other papers are really exploring. I mean, there's a large movement towards nonprofit journalism um, as a way to, you know, we have like the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism mm -hmm. out of Madison. Um, but at the Journal Sentinel, we've really moved towards trying to get almost, I mean, basically endowments and fellowships um, to offset the, re the reporting cost in a lot of ways. So the for example, the fellowship I'm currently on, the O'Brien Fellowship for Public Service Journalism at Marquette, um, they are paying me now. 
I mean, I'm still a Journal Sentinel employee and it funnels through, but that is that helps support our journalism. And you'll have noticed we have um, a few other partnerships and like Greater Milwaukee Foundation, I believe Bader and some others have provided funding for you know specific projects. Now that's important to build in firewalls, right? You know, there's no editorial control linked to that funding. We make all that all those decisions in the newsroom independent of that. Um, but I think you'll see more of that down the line. Well, and then a follow-up question that just came in about that: If Sinclair does purchase Tribune News, uh, how do we protect ourselves from a news owner that might have dictates? Where there's, you know, the editorial control isn't necessarily separated. I mean, I think everyone saw that play out with sort of the viral clip, right, of all the news anchors saying the, the same message. Mm -hmm. um, again, it, it sort of comes down to being informed. And just the only station I believe in town that would be affected by that is WITI TV Channel yeah. 6. Um, it, it's incredibly difficult. I mean, I can, I can tell you from the Journal Sentinel's perspective, we are owned by the USA Today Network. We are owned by Gannett. Um, to my knowledge, we have never had any sort of edict of must run on the editorial page. But again, that's sort of that's that's separate now because of some of the concerns about opinion and separating opinion from reporting and not being very good at identifying that for our audience, for our readers. I can tell you, our Journal Sentinel editorial page is pretty much completely different from what it used to be. It is now the Ideas Lab. It is focused on solutions journalism and is focused on more rigorous reporting and. Because of that, we aren't running, you know, syndicated op-eds or local editorials. Uh, there's some questions, uh, a bunch of them for, for Dr. Kim and her research, and I'm going to try to parse them out as best I can. Um, the first one is that this person is fearful that the mechanism uh, your research described and tracked is already and still is in full force as we are, what, two, two and a half weeks away, three weeks away from the midterm elections. So how, again, how do we protect ourselves? And somebody else wants to know if you actually use Facebook and social media knowing what you know. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> okay, so, um, I have a Facebook page, uh, but I barely use it. Um, um, I don't have a Twitter. My research project has, uh, our group has like a Twitter handle, but uh, we're not good at promotion. Uh, but um, so, like, you know, these days, whenever I go to like a conferences, like people ask me Twitter handle instead of like a business card. So I found like a really interesting and whenever says, oh, I don't have a Twitter handle and people seem to be very shocked. <laughs> um, Okay, and uh, about the midterm elections, uh, unfortunately, we are not collecting data. Um, <laughs> yeah, but we have been monitoring, uh, you know, we have some knowledge and tips uh, how to spot bad actors uh, and voter suppression ads. Uh, so we have been monitoring uh, um, political campaigns by using publicly available sources. Um, so, and I'm just sort of playing devil's advocate here, thinking aloud as you're saying this. So how do we protect ourselves from bad actors who might be doing this without turning it over to a government agency that is going to be a censorship vehicle? You know, how do we balance free speech and protecting ourselves from malicious attacks? Um, so, free, yeah, freedom of speech applies only like a, when like a government like a try to suppress like a speech. Um, so, you know, for example, when self-regulated, uh, like a platforms like a self-regulated policies are not under, you know, uh, the freedom of the, the First Amendment. Um, so um, that's something we have to think about. So we can put some pressure on uh, platforms to have, um, you know, better policies and transparency measures. Um, another thing would be, I mean, um, something over the past six months, like before the summer, like the uh, spring semester, uh, after. Um, analyzed uh, this data, uh, I felt urged to talk to policymakers, so I worked in the DC. 
Um, and there are a lot of people who are thinking about, uh, you know, better policies. Uh, um, uh, unfortunately, there is, you know, no perfect one, uh, but um, one of the things uh, people discuss is the Galanist Daz Act, and then it's going to be reintroduced um, uh, in the next term. But um, so basically, um, it's just a revealing the sources. Uh, uh, when the ads like a specifically like a support or defeat a candidate, um, and tech platforms, large tech platforms are required to archive um, this ad, so that you know once we realize that this is suspicious, and then we can you know go back to uh, you know tech platforms archives, uh, and then these archives are not just to express advocacy like a candidate. Uh, as, but it includes like a national importance issues, uh, because um, if we look at if we analyze like a Russian ads, uh, because Russians exploited it, uh, the cleavage uh, it existing in our society, uh, most of the ads as a whole, um, like a 90, 90, 98 percent of the ads are not mentioning uh, candidates. So if we only look at the candidate as that contain the candidate names, we're missing out a lot of things. Um, but like an issue as is complicated, like you know, uh, like uh, you know, a lot of nonprofits uh, could educate the public, uh, you know, without mentioning candidates or you know, without endorsing support or defeat or attack candidates. Uh, so that's what issue as was supposed to be, but with the that but that was before we had the data and algorithm. Uh, if it is publicly available, then it could work as educational campaigns. But if it's targeted like an extreme people who care about an issue, the issue because of their religious values, because of a uh, racial ethnic identity, because of their self interest, um, then. Um, it tends to polarize like people who take a different positions on issues. Uh, maybe not, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, if you are conservative, like you're probably not going to be more conservative after exposed to the ads. We just to build, you just to, you know, like it. Uh, but you are more likely to hate the other side. So that's like the research has been. Uh, Proven, so that that's called like an affective polarization. So uh, it's not so much about uh, yeah, I, Republicans become more Republican uh, or Democrats become more Democrats. Uh, it's more about um, you know I uh, become like a hating uh, uh, those who do not share the same values or identities uh, or self-interest. Sounds like it's transparency again, like what yeah. Ashley was talking about. Um, we are at uh, 12 o'clock, and I want to end with the philosopher, if I may, because somebody asked a question about how do we how do we ensure that we get real news? And I guess I want to ask you what real news is. You're asking me. I'm asking you. I think because I think that's a philosophy because we've been talking about how we all come to things with our own biases. You know, I mean, who, what, where, when, and why, but all, even those things can be interpreted depending on how you approach those questions. So, you know, if we're, we're asking for this sort of platonic ideal of real news, what, do, what is that? And I, don't how, and how, I don't believe in platonic ideals, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Um, what real news is, you know, I, I, I'm going to back up and I, I want to say something. I'm struck by the similarity in the description of voter suppression by convincing people their vote doesn't count and the attitudes towards, uh, uh, like the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. That, that, the, there, there are, there, that we trade in comments. And maybe this is a way to, to, to talk about this. We'll, we're, we have expectations that drive us to want something from what's outside of us, rather than doing the due diligence. Uh, and I've had many, many uh, discussions with people who tell me their vote doesn't count. And my response is always, your vote doesn't count if you don't vote. Um, <laughs> 
right? I mean, I mean, it, and I understand what, what they're saying because a lot of people feel dispossessed. But if we're talking about in an ideal world, we're not talking about our expectations of what's delivered to us. We're talking about what we're willing to do to make sense of what's before us. And I think part of the, the trouble here is, and that's why I brought up the Journal Sentinel, because I think uh, people make comments about it all the time, and historically, uh, that they're, you know, that, that it, it doesn't really report, and, when, and the, the, the interesting thing is, is that there's always good reporting in it. Um, it just may not serve our own expectations. So what, we have to be vigilant about what we're expecting and um, not expect that others will provide us with the insight and knowledge that we need to acquire. And that, that is why I tell students, pay no attention to any ads about candidates. It's not gonna serve you in any way. Uh, and I, get, I don't know if that answers the question, but it certainly suggests that we have much greater responsibility than we um, expect of ourselves. And that's what we've got to do, is work at that. Exactly. Uh, a couple of people asked Dr. Shapiro if you could make your presentation available in some way because they wanted to reflect on it. And also, Amy, if your, your list of the, the good resources to check, like all sides and that sort of thing, that if you could. Be yeah. Oh, is that outside? Okay, perfect. So whoever asked that question, it's outside. Uh, but is your. Um, sure, I could do that. Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for sitting here, enjoying having this really, really, really important conversation to our panelists, to the League of Women Voters. Thank you. And I apologize if I didn't get to your question. We ran out of time. But I think I got to just about everybody. So. And thanks to Bonnie for moderating. You're welcome.